This is an intro. Intro, intro, intro. Hustle and Float Shark with your boy, my boy, Matt Wolf and Joe Fit. Hey! What's up, everybody? Welcome back to the Hustle and Flow Chart Podcast. <laughs> sure. I didn't know if we were doing every syllable or every word, so I don't know. Matt, we'll, we'll, Matt have to, we'll, have to, we'll have to discuss next time. He was directing traffic with his hand, and I didn't know that was coming. As you know, these intros change every single time, and I never know what the hell it's going to be until we hit record. Absolutely. It's pretty much on the fly. Today on the Hustle and Flowchart podcast, uh-huh. brought to you by evergreenprofits.com. Got to put that in there. Got to put that in there. Um, we've got we've actually got one of my favorite authors. I think probably one of your favorite authors too. Oh, yeah. He's uh, a he's a funny one, and he makes he makes subjects that are seemingly boring from the outside, finance systems, all that fun stuff. Yep, fun stuff <laughs> in quotes. But he actually makes it fun. Like he's the guy that makes it. You want to keep turning the page. It's. It's freaking weird, actually, because like literally this book, Clockwork, his newest one that just came out, is about you know taking yourself out of the business, but it really it hinges on doing a lot of homework in your business and systems and optimizations and getting hiring, delegating. From the outside, that's freaking boring sounding, yeah. but yeah, you know, and you've probably heard it a lot of times, you think, but this time it resonated. Yeah, no, big that's time. that is really his skill set is taking these topics that you kind of go, oh man, not this again, and he makes them really, really entertaining. Um, and you know, I had a lot of aha moments. I mean, you'll hear us throughout this episode say this was another big aha moment mm-hmm. that I had while reading your book. Um, we discovered him through a book called Profit First. Mm-hmm. His name's Mike Michalowicz. I don't even think we've mentioned <laughs> his name yet. So Mike Michalowicz is on the episode today. He's the author of Profit First, The Toilet Paper Entrepreneur, Surge, uh, the newest book, Clockwork. Clockwork. Um, oh, uh, my God. There's one more that I'm missing. A pumpkin plan. The pumpkin plan. Yeah. Um, yeah. So he's, he has he's got cool a, names for his books. I, I let him know that. So he's got a lot of <laughs> a lot of really really great books. I think uh, a lot of bestsellers in there. Yeah. Um, and uh, you know, Profit First really really changed the game for me of like finances and things like in that the business, like yeah. yeah just like business finances and and where my how my money gets allocated and things like that and this new book that it just came out clockwork you'll hear us discuss it um it's very much about systemizing and figuring out how to get yourself out of your damn business and here's one really cool thing about this book and we're going to talk about it on the episode but i want to give you a little teaser here he gives a basically a step-by-step process on how to get yourself out of your business within 18 months and at the end of that 18 months, take a four-week vacation without even checking in on your business. He's got a process, a step-by-step process that you do month by month to get yourself to that point where you feel comfortable. And uh, he's going to break down a lot of these systems and processes and yeah. how to how to delegate, how to automate, how to get things off your plate. And um, just an amazing conversation. Yeah, this was one of those we wanted to keep rolling and rolling and rolling. But yeah. <laughs> So definitely check it out. You're going to love it. This book came to us. We found Mike at the right time for our business. And that is not a joke. Uh, he bought one of the affiliate products we promote, Thrivecart, and we'll say it in there. And we literally saw his name, reached out, and boom, that's how the connection happened. And it's it's really cool. Yep. So <laughs> we're super stoked. Go go check out the episode and also get clockwork. You'll love it. Let's dive in with Mr. Mike McCallowitz. Hey, Mike. Thanks so much for joining us today. How are you doing? I'm doing well. So, uh, Joe, Matt, thank you to you. <laughs> thank you, man. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's interesting how we cross paths. Actually, um, I actually first heard your name because you were on a friend of ours, pod, actually our business partner's podcast, a guy named Brad Costanzo with his yeah. Bacon Wrapped Business podcast. <laughs> He's actually a business partner of ours in one of our other businesses. And I actually heard you on his show, I think maybe twice. Um, but anyway, I got introduced to the Profit First book from that podcast. I went and bought it. I told Joe, you need this book. You've got to go buy it. Uh-uh. Joe went and bought uh-uh. Pro- Profit First. That's a wrong story. That's my awesome. Friend. Yeah. Okay, Joe has a different story. He <laughs> thinks he introduced it to me, but I'm taking credit. But uh, <laughs> no, my bookkeeper, and this is totally true. She's like a super fan of yours, so I'm sure when this comes out, I'll send it her way. She was the one that introduced uh, Profit First to me, and uh, yeah, so it was probably both Brad and I. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, awesome. so you know, fast forward a couple years later, we're you know we're big affiliates of a product called Thrivecart. We actually saw. Um, we actually saw your name come through and so we just we reached out and said hey do you Mm -hmm. we saw you grab Thrivecart if you need any help let us know and um, that's how we got connected so (laughs) super cool (laughs) which by the way we we love and I I love you know when you hear about affiliate relations it's like oh okay so this is someone just trying to sell you Mm. and that's it I mean we bought it 
you sold us, but but you've supported us above and beyond anything I've ever expected. Better better than like many companies support their own business. <laughs> so I appreciate that tremendously. You're, you're welcome, man. And thank you because that's something we literally strive for every single day. That's kind of like where I'm heads down every day. So that's super cool. And you're not the first one to say that where we're like, why are people not doing this right? <laughs> so we'll just keep doing yeah. our thing. That's cool. You're doing it right. <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah, you have a, you have a cool background and you've written a lot of books. They all seem to have really cool names too. Uh, <laughs> I don't know how you do it. Your, your writing style. It's, it's funny cause we were just talking to our ops manager, Shannon yesterday, which we bought her a copy and we're like rushed it to her. So it should be there today. <laughs> I'm like, you need to read this. Oh, but, that's awesome. Yeah. She, uh, we're just like saying, yeah, it's the concept isn't really the, the most entertaining, but the way you write it, the way you present it, you, it's always like puts a smile on both of our faces, every page and it makes it fun. <laughs> yeah. I, I, uh, you know, cause I, cause the topics that are in business are, are pretty, many of them are pretty boring, uh, for me too. Mm. And so, but, but it's necessary. Like we need to talk about the finances. We need to talk about, uh, systems and processes, but I, I do at the same time want to put a you know bullet in my own head. So um, <laughs> when I write these books, I do it first from an analytical standpoint, but then I, I want to put some flavor into it. I, you know, we need to have a fun time doing it. And if finances can be fun, if business efficiency can be fun, if all these things can be fun, uh, then I think we're much more engaged. Yeah. So I, that's the way I need to consume, and that's why I write the books the way I do. Yeah, you're doing it right for sure. Cause yeah, profit first. Me not being, you know, the analytical finance guy. Typically, you put it into friend to terms. I'm like, ah, I get it. Okay, <laughs> that actually seems simple and kind of fun. So um, yeah, and then Clockwork. So the newest book that just released was it last week? I believe. Well, I don't know what the date is, but this will be going live. But um, recently, <laughs> the book came out, and it goes down that same vein. And it's all about, um, I mean, there's so many things there, but it's not productivity. I know that much. <laughs> so It is, yeah. Yeah, no, and that's a point I wanted to talk about. But how would you present Clockwork to the world here? So the subtitle, I think, explains it, and I can give some details, of course. Um, the, the subtitle is Design Your Business to Run Itself. And the concept is, well, it's a, it's a, the book actually is a seven-step process, but what I do is, is I try to define what are the simplest steps that we can get to building business efficiency. And I, I also um, hope that people see it as a complement to some other fantastic books out there, I, like uh, Traction and um, Scaling Up. But, but my, one of my favorites of all time is E-Myth. And I remember submitting uh, meeting with Michael Gerber in Mexico. We, we both, we did a keynote um, back to back at this, this big event. And afterwards we, we decided to grab some uh, dinner together. And um, I don't know if you ever met Michael Gerber or see him speak. He's, yeah. he's an, a little bit, he's a little bit of an eccentric. Yes, um, he is. <laughs> yeah. He, he's wearing his signature outfit with that white, um, hat and, like, yeah. the, like the KFC, the Colonel from KFC kind of outfit. reminds me of the doctor from the first Jurassic Park movie. Yeah. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, yeah. I can't, Actually, I can't think of his name, but the, the main yeah. doctor in that first movie. <laughs> he, he looks exactly, like, and he, he's always in that outfit. And so we're at the dinner and, um, we're talking and I said, I love Emith. And one of the challenges though, I've seen entrepreneurs face after reading that book is that many people, including myself thought that going from working in the business as opposed to on the business, as he, he is, his basis of the book is based on. I noticed that most entrepreneurs think it's a switch. Like one day I'll have enough customers. I don't have to be in the business anymore. Or one day an investor will come in. Or they're, they're looking, We're looking for this event or moment that switches us over all of a sudden. And now we're owners of a business, not slaves to a business. And uh, that's why I wrote Clockwork is because I think, more than think, I know that approach of working on a business as opposed to in business is what we need to do. Michael Gerber nailed it. Yeah. I hope that clockwork now is the path to pulling it off. And what I teach in, profit, in clockwork is it is a throttle. You know, just saying like when, when you start a business, you're like the parent of the business. It's a parent-child relationship. Mm -hmm. You know, I gave life to this business and um, now I, I'm going to nurture it and feed it. And one day the business is going to give back to me. And, and I call BS on that. I, I don't think it's a parent-child relationship. I, I think it's conjoined to twins. You know, like <laughs> we share a soul, we share organs, we share legs, we share everything. 
And therefore, the separation of our conjoined tw twin situation is a very surgical and methodical process. You don't just pull the, the people apart. <laughs> they'll both die. So what you do is you very slowly extract the entrepreneur from the business step by step. And the process can take a long period of time. But if, if you're staying with it persistently, in a year, maybe two years, you're fully extracted from the business. And when the business can run itself, the entrepreneur is elevated to what I think their natural, not their natural, but their most important talent is perhaps their natural talent, which is working on the design. It's something that we did when we, before we started the business. It's the vision. We, you know, we clearly knew what we wanted. Now, when we're extracted from the business, we can revisit that vision, but also make strategic and tactical decisions to navigate our team, the people that are working for us or the resources that we're using and the technology we're using to actually pull it off and get to that vision. Mm, that makes sense. And I, and I love how you connected uh, the e-myth with your book because I could totally see that being absolutely what this is, clockwork. Well, no, it's funny because so my, my dad is an entrepreneur too. He runs a business here in San Diego. And uh, I was talking to him over the weekend and I told him, you got to go grab this book. And he's like, oh, what's it about? And, I, and my description to him was, oh, it's kind of like the e-myth, but I feel like there's way more actionable steps where you can just go follow the process. That was my that was my way of describing it, and that's not to knock mm. Michael Gerber or anything. I love the E Myth, one of you oh, know, yeah. one of my favorite books ever. But that was my description of your book. It's perfect. <laughs> yeah. Well. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So his his book just revisiting that. I, his book is um, I think is really motivational, mm. and uh, I know countless entrepreneurs have visited, have read the book, and and they tried they try it. But then they feel that they're lost. They feel they're kind of thrust into it, and they, and they very quickly revert back. It's normal of us to, uh, when 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 we're struggling, to go back to what's our habits. Even though you know, running a business may be uncomfortable. It's a lot of work. It's a lot of effort. It's very time consuming. But we very quickly revert back to our habit of doing the dirty work uh, in the business because at least we're, we're familiar with it, and. When we try to make this sudden shift, it's not sustainable. It's kind of like, like if you if you want to start running a marathon and never have before, like your first practice, you don't run a marathon. <laughs> like you don't practice for a marathon by running a marathon. You right. have to build to it. And so that's why I hope the transition is, or, or the complement clockwork is to, to E-Myth, but also all the other books out there about systems. I hope it shows you how to build the muscle and ultimately get you running the marathon over yeah. time. I love it. And, and then you, you mentioned the comfort thing. So all of us right now have a safe zone as an entrepreneur, as a human. And you had a cool story in there. For, oh, it was just like a few sentences. I'm sure you know where I'm going already. It was uh, your mentor, Frank. And I thought it was just a hilarious visual, <laughs> kind of freaky too, of sitting on that lawn chair in the future. Um, <laughs> do you know that one off the top of your head? I'm sure. Uh, can you just recite that one back to us? <laughs> Yeah. So yeah, my mentor Frank. Yeah. So uh, the, the rusty lawn chair. I'll never forget that. <laughs> that was. <laughs> the, so he um, <laughs> he's my mentor now for twenty years. He's he's retired actually. Um, mm -hmm. I still meet with him occasionally, and uh, I met with him once. And you know, he had like a uh, a Godfather like voice. He kind of talked like this. <laughs> I first met with him. I had my first company. It was a, a technology business, and he said um, he evaluated my business. He goes. For God's sake, Mike, he goes, if you keep doing what you're doing, one day you're going to end up in a rusty lawn chair with your nut hanging out. <laughs> <laughs> and I remember him saying, <laughs> oh, my God, it's still like, it's the most bizarre thing. And I'm like, is this guy like a sadist or something? Like, wh what's he doing? Like, this is a business coach? <laughs> and um, what he was doing was basically his version of shock therapy. He He – wanted to show me a new way of growing my business, but also knew that I was very stuck in a pattern, a habit, just as we talked about. And if I stayed stuck in that habit habit or pattern, that um, I wouldn't grow. So he was basically saying, if you keep repeating this process over and over again, I want to show you what your future looks like. And he tried to make it vivid and ugly so that I would be shocked into trying something new. And it, it really did wake me up. Now I laugh at it. But back then, I was like, oh my God, what's this guy talking about? But it did get me thinking about our future. And yeah. you know, get, surviving another day is very easy. I just work hard, put out that fire, you know, address that customer that's, that's bitching and moaning. At the end of the day, we're exhausted and tired, but we say, at least we got through the day. 
But soon we got to realize if we keep on repeating that pattern over and over again, that is the definition of our life. And do we want that carrying us through every day of our life to the end? Uh, that's what Frank was trying to teach me. And I was mm -hmm. like, no way. I want to have a business that's, that's running without me. And that's what I've, what I've uh, hopefully achieved in my yeah. businesses now. I love it. No, that, and that visual even, you know, it's, it's obviously, it's probably locked in your brain forever now, but uh, everybody who reads your book too, but it's, it's probably great exercise. It's like, okay, where are you currently right now? Or maybe where are you working towards in your day to day? Is it where you want to be in 20, 30 years or 10 years, whatever it might be? No, uh, in the book, I, I don't know if you remember this or not, because it was very subtly mentioned, but you did, you made a comment at one point in the book, uh, Joe and I have both read clockwork just uh, for, for context, but you did, you did make one point in the book where you said, um, people don't really change kind of like once they, once, once they're set in their ways, it's really hard to get people to change. And it was very subtle. It was mentioned in like one sentence in the book somewhere. Um, mm. so, so I'm curious like what kind of things need to happen to incite the, this, this change that, okay, you need to get on this path of systematizing and, and sort of working your way out of the business. Yeah. There's a few ways I find that incite change. One of them is the one we don't want, but is the most effective. And it's the heart attack, the proverbial heart attack. Mm. You know, it's like if someone's a smoker, Every smoker knows how bad smoking is. Like we don't need more education about how bad smoking is, hoping that will stop people. What they need, uh, some people need, is that heart attack. They, they smoke and all of a sudden they have a heart attack and that is their wake-up call because they really realize this isn't just a theoretical uh, risk. This is actually applies to me and that will stop people from smoking. The problem is, of course, you don't want people to have a heart attack to stop smoking. So then you have to have a visual um, of your own future. And actually, you may even see in smoking commercials, more recent times, they show like a blackened lung and they say, that's your lung if you smoke. They show someone that's <clears throat> on a respirator in the hospital and they say, that's you. Those are much more visceral and therefore they connect much more. So if we can get a vivid vim image of our future, the one nut guy in the mm -hmm. uh, lawn chair, that's another way of doing it. That's actually what Frank was trying to do with me. God. Another way, which is the more, I guess, joyful way, <laughs> is to have um, a clear purpose, meaning a, a greater purpose that we're playing into. I, I think it's a life's purpose and, and defining how our business serves that because that becomes magnetic. As an example, for me, it's very clear for me uh, uh, that my life's purpose is to eradicate entrepreneurial poverty. Mm -hmm. uh, and entrepreneurial poverty is defined by this outside perception. The day you become an entrepreneur, everyone thinks you're a millionaire and everyone thinks you're on the beach drinking margaritas. The reality is most entrepreneurs are struggling to make a penny and uh, th they're working 24 by seven. So there's this kind of outward uh, veneer of success when the reality is, is in shambles. I want to fix that. That's became a clear life purpose for me. Um, and as a result, it becomes a motivator. It magnetizes me. It pulls me toward it. And I'm, I'm running toward an objective. Um, and that momentum of moving towards something um, makes me cognizant that if something is slowing me down or if I'm staying stuck in a pattern, that that's no longer, uh, that's not acceptable. And I get through it quickly. So again, the, the three ways I found is have that financial, have a heart attack of some sort, a proverbial heart attack. The wor that's the worst case scenario. You don't want that. But some people, that's the only way to change. Um, other people, it's to see it in others so vividly that they reflect upon themselves and say, okay, that's my future. I need to change. Or third, which is the best, is have a greater purpose that pulls you beyond the day-to-day -day minutia and, and forces you to keep moving along because you have something greater that you're trying to serve. Mm, I love it. And would you, so that wouldn't be considered your QBR, right? The, uh, the queen, queen bee role that bigger purpose, that would be probably separate, I believe. So I'm sorry, cut out, say it one more time. Uh, oh, uh, so the, so that vision, that bigger purpose, that wouldn't be your QBR, the queen bee role, or would oh, it? Oh, right, it's not, it's not. Okay. So, um, but, it, but it kind of plays into it. So the queen bee role is something I explain in Clockwork, and he, here's how it works. The, the greater vision or purpose uh, is, as Simon Sinek says in his book, Star with Why, it's, the, it's your own personal why and may also, and I think it should, convert into the business's why. The one kind of uh, element directly below that, or maybe above it, depends how you want to say it, maybe why is mm -hmm. the foundation. The next level up is called the, the brand promise. And what a brand promise is, is the 
way you distinguish yourself in the market? What's the one biggest commitment you're making to your clientele? And, and I guess an example of that, mm. like FedEx is a great example because we all recognize the name. FedEx promises, their brand promises to deliver your packages on time. They even have commercials, you know, if it absolutely positively needs to be there tomorrow, we'll make it happen. Mm -hmm. That's their promise. The QBR that you're referring to is one step below that. If we peel back the onion, just one layer, we have to ask ourselves, what is the one singular activity that supports that brand promise? What's the one activity that makes that a reality? And that activity is a QBR. And now the reason I call it the queen bee role is because I looked at um, business efficiency or organizational efficiency and found that beehives were very efficient. The reason beehives are very efficient, every bee knows the most critical role or function in the hive that its thrivability or survivability depends on is the production of eggs. So all the bees know that eggs need to be produced. It happens that the queen bee produces it, but all the bees protect and serve that function. Mm -hmm. In our business, we have that key function. If we look at FedEx, they're promising us to deliver on time. If we peel back the onion one layer, the QBR, the function that supports that is logistics. Every employee knows at um, FedEx, logistics is the most important thing. And the day FedEx says, you know what? Screw logistics. You know, let's be a customer service place and mm -hmm. let's, not, let's not worry about package delivery so much. FedEx will go out of business. Yeah. You know, your, your packages aren't being delivered. So they know this so inherently that if logistics are ever threatened, if packages are being slowed down or whatever, that the rest of the team has to step up. And by the way, this happens every year at FedEx. Every year, uh, FedEx will have a seasonal um, influx. It's, it's around the holiday season in the winter. Mm -hmm. And what the managers do is they don't say, well, drivers drive faster and drive better. They say, you know what? We're going to get on the trucks too. And the management team helps out. They have an influx of part-time help. It's the role mm -hmm. of logistics that matters most. Now, for the folks listening in, it starts off with what's your why, you know, that, that vision, that grand purpose you have. But when it comes to the application of the business, we have to say, how does that translate into a promise? What's the big promise we're making for our community? So, well, my why is to eradicate entrepreneurial poverty. My big promise to my community is to make complex and boring business subjects uh, simple and, and engaging, mm. right? That's my promise. <laughs> then how do I do it? Well, it's through writing books. So I got, that's my queen bee role. I have to write really good books and I have to invest the time uh, to make it, make it a reality. That is the most critical role. And everyone in my organization knows it. Now we're small, we have 10 people here, mm -hmm. but they know if I'm doing a podcast interview like we're doing now or if I'm out speaking or whatever, I can never do it to a point where it's impeding on writing good books. Because if I'm not writing good books, the entire organization is compromised, just like FedEx is. Yeah. So that's what the Queen Bee role is, the most important activity. I love it. Um, Matt, you kind of did a little motion, right? Right when Mike said his QBR. Yeah, QBR. Go into that really quick. Oh, we had okay. a cool story last night. We were our well, two so, nights ago. So Joe and I, we both actually read Clockwork separately. We, you know, we didn't sit there and read it together. <laughs> uh, so we read it separately. And... Um, we, we got together and met a couple nights ago and we're like, all right, did you do the exercises in the book? Yep. Did you do them? Yep. All right. So what's our QBR? And we just kind of like, like neither of us wanted to say what we came up with first. And when we finally said it, we were like spot on with the exact same identical QBR in our business and in our business, it's creating educational content. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it, th there you go. Isn't that funny? Like, so it's you could have a business that, um, I don't know. Like, oh, actually, here's a great example. I even write about them in the book, like a baseball team. I mean, if you look at baseball, um, some people say, well, it's very obvious what, what the core function is, what the queen bee role is. And what it is, is winning games. So you got to, you know, our job is to win games and do whatever it takes. So we got to hire uh, or and recruit the best players. We got to pay the top salaries. It's all about winning. Well, there's one baseball team. It's actually the only baseball team that I'm aware of. And I think it's the only baseball team in history, or at least recent history, to sell out three consecutive seasons, every single game, literally mm -hmm. packed stadium. So not a sellout like they sold all the tickets, which is nonsense. That's brokers mm -hmm. and stuff. But actually pack the stadium. Mm -hmm. And the team is called the Savannah Bananas. Yeah. Uh, you got to check them out. What they decided, they said, you know what? Our brand promise is not going to be winning baseball. We're not going to win games. Uh, our focus is to entertain our, our audience. It's going to be fun family entertainment. Well, that's the promise. Peel back the onion one layer, and the activity that supports that 
is ideating about new ways to entertain. So mm -hmm. the owner of the baseball team and his, he's got like a hundred employees. They have sessions where they just think of what's new, fun, crazy, wacky entertainment we can do. <laughs> Do they have the best team on the league in the league? No way. Uh, they might be a 500 team overall. I, I don't know. Um, sometimes they're good, sometimes not. But no one even cares. What they care about is you are just going to be having the time of your life watching the antics going on at the stadium and the 5,000 people at this game show it. And by the way, this is a uh, a all star team. It's not a minors. It's not a majors. It's it's college recruits. Mm. Uh, a normal game. If you're an all star team. You're lucky to get 200 people in the audience. They get 5,000 because they define their QBR. The QBR is not something that's forced upon us. It's something we declare. Once we make our brand promise, the commitment, how we're going to differentiate ourselves to our customer base, we can define that and we can define the QBR that delivers on it. Yeah, no, that's so interesting too. Because I mean, a team like what you're explaining, um, I, I remember this example from the book. They, they, there's basically turnover too, so it's not like anybody's coming out to see some superstar player. They don't know the players on the team, so the you know having this culture of we're here to entertain first. That's the goal. Whether the team wins or loses, it doesn't matter as long as the people in the crowd are entertained, and that's what people keep coming mm -hmm. back for i mean we live in san diego so if <laughs> winning is the qbr of any sports team san diego would never have any fans <laughs> <laughs> yeah just, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we've we've grown up here so it's definitely a uh, deeply ingrained in us <laughs> that's fine that's funny well you're in a beautiful yeah, so. part of the world so uh don't it complain is, about yeah. that part but you know i think what it, it boils down to is we can pick we can pick the qbr and even you know, the next baseball team can say, well, we can be entertainment, but that's already kind of taken. We could be winning, but we don't have a chance of that. We can just be the most lavish experience. We can just care for our customers so much. Could you imagine a baseball stadium that had the courage that every chair was a lazy boy chair, kind of like some movie theaters are doing now? <laughs> oh, yeah. Like, I think there's opportunities to redefine it. It just takes courage to do that. I love it. And then you're going to get people who actually don't like baseball to watch you know, or go to yeah, a baseball exactly. game, <laughs> which are a lot of people too. Yeah. But um, that's besides the point. I love it. So the QBR was actually a big aha for us. And you know, it took us, Matt and I individually, probably half the book to finally realize what it is. And you know, we individually got to it because we thought it was tactics at first. So things like, okay, drive traffic, or sell affiliate products, our own product. But um, yeah, at the core of it, it's cool. And you have some really good visuals of, okay, so now that you know the QBR in the middle, you have these spokes of different roles that you do, that your your whole team mm. does, that you work people through. Um, I think it was just really mind opening. It was awesome. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah. so just to play out that visual for, for the listeners, is um, once you identify the QBR, you need to identify who's serving it. Now, often in small businesses, it's us, the owners, who are serving it. In bigger businesses, like think about a hospital, it's often not the hospital owner who's serving the QBR. And for most hospitals, the QBR is uh, effective, immediate patient care. That's usually rendered by the doctors. And so the doctors are serving the QBR, but they aren't necessarily the owners of the hospital. So as your business grows, if you are serving the QBR, you can remove yourself. But what you do in this process is you write down that primary job function that you're serving, the QBR, and you put it as a bullseye in the middle of a piece of paper, you know, an eight and a half by 11 piece of white paper. You then put a circle around that QBR. So it could be, uh, we'll, we'll pick on the Savannah Bananas, you know, mm -hmm. uh, picking, uh, defining extraordinary or, or creating extraordinary entertainment or ideating about extraordinary ent entertainment. That's what the owner, Jesse Coles, his name does. He then puts a circle around it. But he also may take care of vendor relations. He may um, d d you know, handle uh, food logistics. Uh, he may hire people. Uh, he may fire people. Marketing. So he's the HR guy. Yeah. All these other activities. What we do is we draw out on any given week, how much time do these other activities take? Maybe the HR takes only a few hours a week, but maybe the, the logistics for getting food in and out of there for all these different games. Maybe that's like 10 hours a week of, of coordinating all that stuff. Each So it's, so that QBR is the hub. Each spoke off there is each of these other tasks. And the length of the spoke represents the time. So then if it, that takes two hours is a segment that's, say, you know, two, two inches long. And something that takes 10 hours, as this example would go, would then be 10 inches long or five times longer than the two. And it makes this visual that you can see 
what activities are taking you the furthest away from doing the most important task. And those are the things that take us furthest away that we need to find a way to assign to other people's, to transfer those out. Um, ultimately, we want to remove all of the superfluous tasks and just focus on the QBR because that most elevates our business. That's our brand promise. And then the final stage of a clockwork business is to even remove the owner from doing that work in the first place so that other people are doing the work. And now the owner is functioning as a designer. They are overseeing the business, but they're not in the business. Mm. And that is when the four week vacation comes into play, huh? <laughs> Oh, yeah. <laughs> that, that's a killer hook to this whole book is like it's pretty much the promise if, if folks commit to the clockwork uh, to create a clockwork business is, hey, in 18 months, you're going to be able to go on a four week vacation because your stuff's going to be so dialed in. And uh, chat about that a little bit because I know you have some phases. It's not all or nothing, you know. <laughs> Just yeah. So as I was, um, so this book, it took me about six years to write it. And, uh, good portion of that is research. In fact, I got to the point where I had written the manuscript about three years ago and I looked at it and I was like, this is, this is not it because we started testing it and it didn't work for all businesses and had to, as painful as it was, throw out an entire manuscript and, and start again. I, I pulled some good parts out of it, but the rest had to be redone as I reevaluated business. And one of the components I found is the ultimate test. In fact, the only effective test to see if a business can run itself is to extract the owner from the business entirely. And what I mean by this is to pull them uh, from a uh, physically disconnect them from the business, but also pull them out. So they're digitally disconnected from the business. And I also found that we need to do it for an extended period of time. Four weeks seems to be ideal. Now, let me tell you what happens in four weeks. For most businesses, every cycle uh, businesses cycle on a monthly basis. So they experience everything in that period of time, like you know, invoicing, new customer, customer complaints or challenges, hiring, firing, admin work. Everything happens every single month. So if the owner is totally absent and the business can run during that month in their absence, it's proving that it can run without them. Now, most owners, when, we, when they go on vacation or break from the business, they play a game. And what the game is this, is say, you know, I say, I'm going to go away for a week for my business. And what I do is the, the week leading up to it, I start cramming more and more work in. In fact, the day or two before I leave, I pack in so much work, hoping that will bridge me over until I return. I try to get all done in advance. Then, so it's cram in the beginning. It's cramming, cramming, cramming. Sounds familiar. Then, yeah. then when I return, I'm like, the, the oh shit moments happen. It's like, oh my God, I didn't, this problem happened, all these things. Now it's the scramble. So I call it the cram and scramble. We just try to bridge over this week. That's, that is not a business that's running independently of us by any stretch of the imagination. We're just playing a game with time. Now, some entrepreneurs say, well, I'm going to take a two-week vacation. But they, what I found, typically do a workcation. That's where they, you know, they, they say, well, I'm just going to check email at 6 in the morning. And they end up checking email until about noon. And then they take a little bit of vacation time here and there. And then they're back to work while they're traveling somewhere. So that's not effective. What we do with the four-week vacation is literally physically and digitally disconnect you for an entire four-week period. The business is now without you, and the business needs to survive on its own. Now, to your point, is you know it's not like tomorrow morning, let's go on a four-week vacation and see how we do. That will probably devastate your business if you're not prepared. Yeah. What we do is we're going to stage it. We're going to take a one-week vacation. Um, maybe a, a few months from now and see how that goes, but a full digital disconnect. See if my, my team around me can support it. And even if you're a solopreneur, uh, you can still disconnect by having a team of contractors that you work with or virtual help and automation that takes care of things. Then after we come back and we see what didn't work, whatever didn't work are the things you need to fix for the next vacation, which is now going to be a two-week vacation that we take in the near future. Then we come back, see what didn't work, fix that, and we try another one, maybe a three-week vacation. We go through these tests, um, and whatever doesn't work, you fix. The final vacation being the four-week vacation, and when you come back, whatever didn't work, again, you fix, and then we go into these cycles of taking four-week vacations until things go seamlessly. Hmm. One of the people I wrote about in the book, her name is Cindy Thomason. She's returned from her four-week vacation, this is maybe two months ago, right, right when the book was printed, so I couldn't put her final story in, but I wrote a blog post about it. Cindy went away for four weeks, came back, business was bigger. Uh, she has uh, some employees there. Employees decided to raise the rates on a customer um, 
to, to, to right size the, the, the revenue coming in from that customer. Customer was uh, glad to pay it because they were getting such good service. And uh, when she uh, debriefed with her team and said, you know, what worked, what didn't work, they went through a few things that needed to be fixed. And they, she said, what's the biggest challenge we have going forward? And they said, Cindy, our fear is that you're going to reinsert yourself in the business. We've got this. <laughs> now. We need you being our visionary. And mm-hmm. it gave it gave her goosebumps. She got excited about that. And oh, and yeah. she now one one week a month, she's digitally disconnecting. So this is her second month into it mm-hmm. from the office. And she's just sitting there thinking to the point there's a statue dedicated to this most important process. It's called the thinker. You know, mm-hmm. there's this <laughs> this naked guy with his chin on his fist sitting there contemplating. And that's what <laughs> Cindy's doing. And My, <laughs> we're only two months into this, but she she's coming up with these concepts um, that will radically improve her business and stuff that she would have never done before if she was stuck in the weeds. I love it. Now, uh, now is the, is the vision for us, Mike, to all become a naked person that just stands and thinks for yeah. a while with their leg up? Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. That's the ultimate uh, goal in life. Not the vision. I, I don't, I'm not trying to start a world of naked people. Um, <laughs> but but the vision is for you other. to be a thinker. It, it is to think more. That is so important. It, yeah. I get frustrated about how much talk is about hustle and grind and pushing yourself. I understand the sentiment, but I think it's being misconsumed. I think people are thinking we got to work harder and harder. And that is a fallacy. We need to think smarter and smarter. That's the goal. I love it. And that's where, uh, well, a couple things. I know we've all shared, I know I've been there before, not on the beach per se, like the stock photos have mm. corrupted all of our minds <laughs> where you bring a laptop to the Caribbean beach and you're like, no, why would you ever want to do that? It's horrible. Um, but yeah, we've all been there. I'm sure. <laughs> all been there. I've done it myself. I've, yeah. I've done it countless times. It's only in recent years. You know, the nice thing about being an author and writing uh, these books is it's the ultimate accountability mechanism. Like if I don't live a clockwork life, if I don't live by profit first, I, I'm a charlatan. So I have to do this stuff. So as I was writing clockwork, I guinea pig on myself uh, and other clients are willing to try things out. Um, but then once I release the book, it's like, I have to live by this. So I, I used to be that guy and I was actually proud of it. Like, oh my God, I'm a workaholic. I can get so much done. I, mm. I've, I've gone 180% about face. I don't, pride myself in working more. Uh, I pride myself in, in having a business that's growing as efficiently as possible with the least active input from me. Yeah, no, that's interesting. I, I, I love the example you gave of the, the people coming back, uh, you know, the lady coming back and then her team members saying, we're afraid you're going to get more involved in your business again. <laughs> um, I, I, for me, when I go on vacation, I have this sense of, of guilt around the business, around not being in the business, this, this sort of sense of guilt of knowing that I have other team members back there getting stuff done while I'm sipping, sitting here on a beach, sipping a margarita, I should probably check in on them. And there's this like, yeah. this like guilt element of it. Yes. Yes. <laughs> so that is one of the major roadblocks. There's actually two, there's ego and guilt. And I'll also explain how both play out. Guilt is, um, yeah, it's the feeling like, oh my God, I'm, I'm giving other people my burden. This is my business. I'm the big benefactor, right? So I gain the most financially, but now I'm basically working off the other people's sweat. Mm-hmm. Uh, but what, another way to see this is empowerment. What we're doing is we are giving people an opportunity to step into a role that only we were filling before, which means they are up-leveling their ability. Um, and if they can up-level, that means they can receive more compensation through our organization as our organization grows. So instead of seeing guilt, we have to see empowerment. Now, the other side is ego, right? Ego is like, um, um, and this happened to me. My business didn't, didn't need me. I took a two-week vacation. I went to Australia. Uh, I was still checking emails, which I shouldn't have been, but I was. Mm-hmm. And uh, I noticed that everyone was emailing me about the business. Well, after four or five days of this, I wanted to pull my hair out. Like I thought my business was going under... Uh, and no one was calling me. So I reinserted myself in the business. And the response was, no, we've got this, Mike. And uh, that bruised my ego. I said, I'm, I'm not needed in my own company anymore. Mm. Oh, my God. So I started to reinsert myself and, and ask questions and require reports and do all these things that people didn't or, or couldn't do. And, um, and, and I started to unwind the progress we made in our company. To ch- you know, Ego is a real issue. And so... Yeah. I don't believe we can just squash our ego. I think we need to rechannel it. Mm-hmm. So what I, I told myself, I said, listen, Mike, talking to myself, I mm-hmm. need to up level my game here and I need to be a designer. I need to choreograph our resources, organize our team here so we can start getting the results that 
we want as an organization. I mm -hmm. need to play at a higher level. And if I reinsert myself in the business, I'm actually pulling us down. So my, I just took that ego and redirected it. And mm -hmm. that, that seemed to, to work pretty well. I love it. Yeah, I think for me, the, the, I think my biggest aha moment reading your book what came during the, the section where you were talking about the four Ds. Um, I believe doing, deciding, delegating, designing. Um, <laughs> yeah, nailed it, nailed it. <laughs> uh, so I, I wrote up on our whiteboard four Ds. I didn't. I should have, in retrospect, written out what they all were, so I wasn't so um, uncertain of myself. It was a good but test. Anyway, uh, the the <laughs> biggest sort of um, aha that I had was the basically the difference between deciding and delegating, you know, Joe and I, we, we're constantly talking about, yeah, we're, you know, we've got stuff really well delegated in our team. We've got great team members. We, we love the people that work for us. They do a really good job, but in retrospect, we're looking back on it and we're essentially just kind of passing tasks over to them. And then they're yeah. coming to us with all of their questions. Mm. And so our day to day went from us doing these tasks to us giving these tasks to other people but still working just as much responding to questions and, and, and working with the yes. people. And yes. that was the big aha was the, the sort of the, the differentiation between being a decider in your business and being a delegator in your business. So do you want to speak yeah. into that for a minute? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that can, Oh my gosh, can that, that become frustrating? So yeah. the, the, the doing stage is, is where we do work. The deciding phase is where we really become task rabbiters. We hire a couple of people, we give them an assignment to do something. And then, you know, it's like a minute later, they come back with a question. Like I say, hey, you know, you know, uh, Joe, please do some invoicing. And you're like, ah, okay. And then you come back a second later and say, you know, should I be billing in 15 minute increments or like an hour? Mm -hmm. And I make a decision around that. And then you come back in a minute later and say, you know, how do I sort these people out by last name? Is that how we bill? You know, and it's just constant stream of questions. What happens is I, the, the owner of the business, I'm not able to do the other work that I wanted to do because I'm constantly distracted by the influx of constant questions. Now, the reason this happens is for the employee, the best thing to do is ask the owner questions because then you can do no wrong. Whatever mm -hmm. I say, if you do it, if it's a mistake, well, I'm the idiot, uh, the owner. And if it's right, well, you just did what you were told. Mm -hmm. So it's a win for you. And most owners continue to do it because it's fast. It's easy. It's easier just to give the quick answer then then spend the time to really think about the process and then transfer it over to the the people so it serves both of us it also serves our ego too because you know we know all the answers we're a superhero we <laughs> swing in and solve another problem and then fly back out the we need to move to a higher level which is called delegation and most people don't understand delegating they say they're delegating when they're actually task rabbiting delegation is not the assignment of tasks delegation is the assignment of outcomes and what I mean here is we have a clear uh, goal that we're looking to achieve. As the example with invoicing, instead of saying, you know, do this process of invoicing, I may say to an employee, it's important that we bill accurately and timely. We have a best practice invoicing process that I'll share with you. Um, as you go through it, if you have any questions or problems that you face, I've hired you for what's on your shoulders. It's called your brain, your head, and I want you to make decisions. I want you to make decisions that you feel are in the best interest of moving our company forward and improve on our processes. Now, that's how you sign outcomes. You, you, you empower them to make decisions. Here's the reality and the challenge we're going to face. If we tell them to make decisions, they will first come to us without making decisions because that's so atypical. They'll ask questions. When they come with a question, we have to say, I'm not going to answer that for you. Uh, I've hired you because, because of your smarts. I want you to come back in with your decision. Now, when they come back with an answer and say, this is the way I think we should proceed, your answer can only be to support it. Even, and this is the hardest mm -hmm. part, even if it's a bad decision. Mm -hmm. Because if they make a bad decision and we say, oh, sorry, you're an idiot, don't do that. We've unwound the delegation. We're not empowering decision-making and we're taking it back. We're going right back to that deciding phase. So you must reward all decision-making, even bad decisions. Then when they make a bad decision, you say, listen, we're not getting the outcome we want and, and you know why. Um, I'm, again, I want, I'm proud of you because you made a decision that you felt is in the best interest of the company. Uh, it didn't work out the way we hoped. Go back in there, Tiger, figure it out, find some way to navigate through this. By doing that, now you're empowering employees to take ownership over decisions and really get independence from you know, the day-to-day -day tasks in your business. I love it.
That is, that was such a big aha for us and, and definitely something we're working on now. And it's partially goes into, Hey, don't give them all the answers either. You know, like have them put a little skin in the game to kind of think it through. And this is where your capture method of your systemization is really cool. And we were doing, I'd say half of it mm-hmm. of, of, you know, capture with video screen share, pass it over to the team system, you know, actually write it out in a doc. But you almost take it a well. You do take it a next step where you give it to those uh, those folks, and then they essentially follow, poke holes, and then re-record the capture on their end. So they're kind of creating the answers, getting a little bit of input from you. But that ownership, it's it's a total delegation oh, yeah. model there. It's that, super cool. that was a huge concept for for us for sure. Because like Joe said, we actually you know our, our business is actually fairly simple to systematize because we're online based. Almost everything we do is at a computer. So yeah, install screen capture software, hit record every time we do something, hmm. and you know we've got all of our systems documented after a certain amount of time. The big thing for us was this this concept of giving this educational content to our team members let them go through it try to do it ask their questions as they go through it and then re-record it themselves to a um you know now they become the teacher of it so by becoming the teacher you obviously it sinks into your brain a little bit better when you start teaching it um but also you know now they kind of have ownership of this process because they're the one who's who's teaching it now Mm. that concept just kind of blew us away and added this whole new level of this this is how we got to start systematizing and we mentioned before the show that we actually bought a copy of this book for our operations manager because we basically <laughs> want her to read through the book and say all right this is how we're going to start systematizing I things love from now on out <laughs> yeah i um i was once uh doing a presentation at a university and uh, as i was walking down uh with the host we're walking by uh, this room as uh, so there are some students as we're getting to the auditorium and uh, the host points in there and says, oh, there's this, the smartest student. And I kind of looked in and I saw someone, one of the kids there taking notes and stuff. I was like, oh, okay. And we walked by another room and then she said kind of under her breath, oh, there's the smartest student. She repeated a few times and I said, what are you doing? How are you picking out the smartest person? And she looked at me and said, oh, the smartest student is always the teacher. She was pointing to the professors. <laughs> and th- that's kind of the golden lesson here is once we create a system and I encourage everyone to do it through you know technology nowadays uh screen capture or use your smartphone but Mm -hmm. capture the process as you do it you then give it to someone so they can copy the process that's right in front of them they can watch the video over and over again so they can do the process verbatim but the key to learning is then teaching right that's when you become the best student so we mandate that everyone that now takes on a task does a subsequent video also we encourage them we want them to include any improvements they have um which means they take ownership over it. And by creating the next video, now they have to really master the process beyond just copying uh, tasks, you know, kind of like Simon says. Mm -hmm. Now they are actually teaching it so they understand at a much more intellectual and visceral level and are likely to execute on it much more consistently. Plus, you set yourself up for them to transfer to someone else in the near future if uh, if that's appropriate. Yeah. And, I, and it's great for any businesses. We've had this in previous podcasts, but it doesn't matter if you know, you're know you a one-person show. It's probably easier if that's the case. Just at least capture the stuff. Um, yeah, or it's great for folks wanting to sell their company, scale, whatever the intention is. It's important for everyone. There's benefits for all. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, yeah the idea, uh, you know, as business owners, as the business grows – with the realize kind of how the math works and, and, and how work gets uh, transferred throughout the company. Mm-hmm. You know, when you're a solopreneur and you hire the first employee, that's a hundred percent growth in our business. Yeah. That's like Google saying, you know, with their hundred thousand employees, Hey, we just hired another hundred thousand employees today. <laughs> like that's the significance of that first hire. You're doubling your capabilities. Um, and therefore, they, they need to take on a lot of responsibility, even if they're an entry-level person, for taking on tasks, ideally half or more of your workload, right? As you hire more people, you hire the second or third employee, well, now you've improved, you've grown your company by another 50% or 25%. So as we get bigger and add individuals, the impact on the company as a whole reduces percentage-wise. So it's the, in the beginning, we have to get these habits in place uh, because those people that we hire then are going to transfer out to the next set of people coming in and so forth. 
And the, the, the truth is for most companies, most small businesses will never have more than five or 10 employees. Um, that's the reality. Most companies actually will never surpass a million dollars in revenue. Mm -hmm. uh, for anyone listening in that has, congratulations. You're, you're part of an elite few, but it's unlikely you'll pass 10 million, statistically think, just speaking. Um, therefore, every individual hire that we bring on has actually a big impact on our business. Google hires one person, it's a, it's a drop in the bucket. We hire one person, that's, the bu that's another bucket. Like That's a big deal. So we just have to see it from our perspective and the impact of the numbers, even on small businesses, is, is super big when you hire an individual and start the, the delegation of tasks and so forth. Yeah, no, I, I, have, I have one last question and we'll kind of start to wrap up because I want to be respectful of your time. Um, when it comes to hiring people, what advice do you have for that, that solopreneur that's just running their own business and is just really scared to make that financial leap of taking on you know, additional, um, additional spend in their business? Yeah, so it's the ultimate trap that every solo entrepreneur faces, right? We, we sit here and we're working hard, working hard, we're generating revenue and we look and say, I need to make a hire because I can't work anymore, but I can't afford to make that hire. Therefore, I need to work harder and push further, but I'm exhausted and so I need to make the hire. And now we're stuck between a rock and a hard place. Here's the key, set, and this is a trick from Profit First, set up another account, a bank account and call it future employee. Start paying their salary as best as you can, even before you hire the person into this account. You start reserving money. What this will do is prove if you can or cannot afford the cash flow hit to pay them. If you can't, now some money's reserved and you got to maybe reduce the amount you're contributing. If you can, over a period of time, you say, okay, we can afford this. Then you can go make the hire. Now, the beautiful thing is if you've been reserving money for three months or maybe six months, you now have a six month reserve for this employee that you can pull from that account and have no financial impact on you. So you know you're prepared and you have a buffer. That's kind of the coolest little hack to get through that sticky spot. I love that. I remember reading that in the book and I was like, that is so cool and so damn simple. <laughs> like, yeah. It's just like, and thank you for finally bringing it up. But uh, I mean, same with Profit First. It's, so, it's such a simple concept. And yeah, it could involve multiple accounts and all that stuff. But at the same time, it's very simple the way you laid it out. So Not to it's, mention, it's one of the most fun reads right. on the topic of personal finance <laughs> <laughs> and business finance. Oh, thank I would, you. Yeah. Thank I you. I agree with that one for sure. <laughs> well, um, I, uh, we can keep going all day. But yeah, let's uh, let's wrap it up here. And um, what's the... Actually, do you have an audiobook for Clockwork? Oh, yeah, yeah. It came out the same day. So it's on Audible and iTunes and all that stuff. All right. Awesome. We're going to get that because that's actually how we read, quote, quote, read Profit First. And we thought it was super cool because not only do you keep the books fresh and entertaining, the the audiobooks, you kind of interject random yeah. stories yeah. <laughs> that are just Yeah, I added, uh, there were some stories that I added back. They were in the, the original manuscript and uh, due to the nature of publishing, I, I had to cut it down, yeah. but I put them back in the Audible. So they're there. Cool. Yeah. Right. We'll, we'll definitely be picking that up. Uh, what are some books, other you know, resources and things that you personally go to? Uh, you, me you mentioned uh, Start With Why is one of them, oh, Simon yeah. Sinek's. Any others that you kind of refer to? Yeah, so Simon Sinek stuff I love. I, I, I'm an avid reader. Uh, I, you know, one thing I did, I don't think, well, actually, I don't even know if it's appropriate for listeners, but it's appropriate for me. <laughs> go I go for on it. Amazon so. periodically and see what the number one book is, the, meaning the number number one, like the true top selling book in the world and not, not a flash in the pan for the day. I mean, something that's consistently there. Mm -hmm. And whatever book that is, I'm like, I got to read that. There's a reason the world is compelled to read this. I recently, there's a, a book for women. Uh, it's called Girl, Wash Your Face uh, by Rachel Hollis, I think is her name. Um, and so I'm listening to this, this book for chicks. And <laughs> I got to be honest, it's pretty amazing. Uh, it, it opened my eyes to something I wasn't aware of. So um, I think that's one kind of cool resource. And I don't know if that applies yeah. to everyone listening. But for me, it's been a cool way of breaking out of my comfort zone of reading the same type of book over and over mm, and discovering something new. Oh, I, I love that. Joe and I were actually just having this conversation um, or a little earlier today about, you know, for the most part, we don't go straight to like the, the typical business books. In fact, we actually find like a ton of wisdom in just random, completely unrelated books. Uh, like Neil deGrasse Tyson was one of the mm. guys we were talking about where when you start reading some of these other books outside of business, you start finding things, you start finding connections that you don't really, 
notice by just staying in that bubble of reading business books all the time. You so, go lateral with it. Um, yeah. I, I love yes. that concept of let's let's you know let's get outside of our own book bubble. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. So, so, yeah, you got to get out of the bubble, right? Because otherwise, it's that rusty lawn chair, potentially. <laughs> you don't want that thing slipping out. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, no. No one wants it. No. On that note, where should people go find? <laughs> um, yeah. Where's where, obviously Amazon, you're there, but where's a, where do you want people to go really check you out? Yeah. Stop. So, the hub for me is my website, which is mikemichalowitz.com. I do have a shortcut to get there because Michalowitz is you know, basically impossible to spell. It's, <laughs> MikeMotorbike.com. That was my nickname in high school, and you can go there. <laughs> nice, and we'll definitely link that up in the show notes too. So that's another thing with you. I noticed you have all these like sub little like notes and stuff in the book, and you have so many domain names that are just out there and funny and have a, their own little story or something happening. So it's it's super cool. Mm -hmm. I just like how you're doing. You're, you're keeping it fresh, Mike. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> it's fun. All right, man. Well, it's been a pleasure. Definitely go check out everything of Mike's. Uh, 100% recommended. So have a good one, Mike. Thanks for coming on the show. You too, guys. Thank you so much. See it. All right. Thank you. And I hope you just enjoyed this episode you just listened to. Now, right now, before we sign off, I have a few things I would love for you to do. So the very first thing is to go find our guest on Facebook and tell them that you loved their episode with us. That's going to help them uh, just feel good about themselves, but also uh, it's going to spread the word a little bit more for us. So go find them on Facebook. Everybody's on Facebook and go say that you love their episode and maybe one cool thing that you learned there. The second thing is to go to iTunes and subscribe to our podcast. Just look up Hustle and Flow Chart and hit the subscribe button. And the very last thing, the third thing is to leave us a review on iTunes or wherever you're listening to this podcast and help us spread the word more. That's how more people are going to get uh, this awesome knowledge, this, this cool podcast training and a whole bunch of other cool free training that we give out at evergreenprofits.com. So that's about it. Go find them on Facebook. Go subscribe on iTunes and leave us a review. You would be amazing if you did that, but you're always amazing. So thanks for listening and we'll catch you in the next episode.